Welcome everyone to today's Institute for Government event, How Taiwan Became a Coronavirus Success Story. I'm Gavin Freegard, Programme Director for Data and Digital Government at the Institute, and it's a good morning from me here in London to all of you. And a very good evening to Taipei, from where I'm delighted to say we're joined by Audrey Tong, the Taiwanese government's digital minister. We'll hear from Audrey shortly, but first some digital housekeeping. If you'd like to tweet along with today's event, you can do so using the hashtag IFGDigital, and we'll be live tweeting from at IFG events. If you'd like to ask Audrey a question, you can submit them to me in three different ways. First, by using our slider, where you can also vote on the questions that you like the most. You can get there using bit.ly slash IFGTong, as well as the longer link you'd have had in the event invitation. Second, you can use hashtag IFG Digital on Twitter. And third, you can drop a question into the chat on this live stream broadcast. And if you use Twitter or live stream, one of my colleagues will drop that question into Slido. Video and audio of this event will be available on the IFG website afterwards. So how did Taiwan become a coronavirus success story? Here in the UK, debate rages as to whether the death toll is closer to 40,000 or 60,000. Whereas in Taiwan, a country of 24 million people with lots of travel to China, there have been fewer than 450 cases and only seven deaths. While many countries have struggled to negotiate their way into and out of lockdown, Taiwan has kept its schools and businesses open. Where the UK has had debates about personal protective equipment procurement and wearing masks, donating them as humanitarian aid. Even the Taiwanese response to panic buying toilet roll was rather different to ours, something I'm sure we'll come on to. So how has Taiwan done all of that? Well, answering that question and many more today is Audrey Tong, Digital Minister in the Taiwanese government since 2016. Audrey dropped out to junior high school and had founded her first business by the age of 16, later becoming an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. She returned to Taiwan and joined its vibrant civic technology community, a community responsible for projects including GovZero, an open source, open government collaboration, and VTaiwan, a pioneering public engagement platform. Since Audrey became digital minister, even more of that civic hacker expertise and way of working has been brought into government, with Taiwan seen as a world leader on everything from open data to open consultation. Um, so I'll start asking Audrey some questions. I'll then start taking your questions and putting those to her as well. And we'll be finishing at around 10.30 British summer time, so just under an hour. So without further ado, um, Audrey, uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. How did, uh, how did the Taiwanese government first learn that uh, coronavirus might be uh, providing a problem that you needed to deal with? Yeah, hello, uh, and have a good local time, I guess, uh, everyone. Um, today marks uh, eight weeks since our last locally transmitted case, uh, meaning that um, as of today, uh, it's the start of our new way of life post-COVID. So um, I first would like to express my gratitude uh, for best and foremost uh, to the collective intelligence uh, system. In Taiwan, uh, we have three principles of social innovation, fast, fair, and fun, which all contributed to the counter-coronavirus effort. And collective intelligence relies on the society to report on our new way of happening. And, and we have, in particular, Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, to thank, uh, because Li Wenliang um, shared that there may be new SARS cases, actually seven confirmed SARS cases uh, back in last December. And whereas many jurisdictions began uh, heeding that early this year, Taiwan started last year. So as you can see in the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit, it's called the PDD, someone with the nickname Normal Pipe reposted Dr. Li Wenliang's message on the very early hours of December 31st. And because of that, we immediately, um, it went um, viral uh, on the PTT, meaning that uh, people upvoted it. And because of that, our medical officers noticed this post and issued that order the very next day that says all passengers flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan need to start health inspection the very next day. And so this says to me two things. First, the civil society trusts the government enough to talk about possible new SARS outbreaks in a public forum, because we're, according to Civicus Monitor, the most open society in the whole of Asia. And also the government trusts citizens enough to take it seriously and treat it as if SARS happened again, something we've always been preparing since 2003, including setting up the Central Epidemic Command Center 
even before we have the first locally con uh, confirmed case. So they run this daily press conferences until yesterday when we officially declare we're now in post pandemic. Excellent. Um, well, congratulations on, on being post-pandemic, um, something I know those of us uh, in the UK would uh, welcome happening quite soon. Um, so you sort of found out uh, via the sort of Taiwanese Reddit, um, this was how, did, how, did the, how did the government sort of swing into action? Uh, what, what did you put in place to be able to deal, deal with everything? Sure. So uh, the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center, Epidemic Command Center, is the the core, the cornerstone of this rapid, fast response system. Because uh, for many months, um, ever since January, they hold a daily press conference, which is always live streamed, and we work with the journalist community uh, and making sure the CECC answer all the questions. And this is a new structure. Back in two thousand three, when SARS happened, the municipal government, the local officials, the medical officers from the central government. Um, all said very different things and very different things. Uh, response, response. So post SARS, we're like, yeah, uh, 37 people dead is 37 people too many. We need to run yearly drills and as if SARS has happened again every year and increase our response system. So anyone uh, with a telephone can call 1922 and learn about the latest CECC announcements. And so any new idea to the CECC, which always gets responded the very next day. For example, there was one day in April where a young boy said they don't want to go to school because their schoolmate may laugh at him for wearing a pink medical mask. And the very next day, everybody in the CECC press conference started wearing pink medical masks, um, making, sure making sure that everybody learned about, about gender mainstreaming, which is again a social innovation. So this kind of guaranteed fast response builds this trust between the government and the civil society, making sure that the mask use, use around hand sanitation, around physical distancing, and our value and so on. People watch these daily uh, 2 p.m. press conferences and bit by bit become kind of amateur epidemiologists that understand the underlying science, which is again very important if you're going to mobilize the whole society without relying on top-down lockdowns, which we never did. So how, how did you avoid um, those lockdowns? I think your sort of uh, slogan for your response is fast, fair and mm -hmm. fun. I wondered if you could That's talk right. us through that. Sure. So the fast part I, I talked about and the fair part uh, has a lot to do with, with the GovZero movement, which you already mentioned. The idea of GovZero movement is very simple. For every government website, uh, such as join.gov.tw, um, people who don't like this uh, service can build a shadow service just by changing an O to a zero. And, and that's it. And so without uh, paying for advertisement or anything, people learn that if you change gov.tw to g0v.tw, then you get into the shadow government that uses the same data, but presented in a much more interactive and participatory way. And so in uh, fairness, for example, when we ramped up the facial mask production, making sure everybody can use their national health insurance card to collect masks from nearby pharmacies. Fairness is, of course, our guiding principles. However, even before the government figure out how to make sure that people can see that this is being fairly distributed. This is, uh, this is um, a uh, civic technologist from Tainan uh, with the name Howard Wu, who built a map of all the nearby places that sells masks and relying on citizens to reply the current stock level, whether they have sold out or not. So this is not unlike like Ushahidi or other um, open source crowdsourcing uh, platforms. However, uh, because he did not anticipate that a lot of people, millions of people, would end up using this service. He very soon owed um, Google about 20k uh, euros uh, in API usage fees and have to close down that operation because he could not fund it himself. But the two day uh, of this map running um, is sufficient to build a social sector consensus that this is exactly what's needed uh, for ensuring fair, fair distribution. So I showed this map, uh, how it would work, to our premier, uh, Su Zhen Chang, and he immediately saw the value of it and said that we need to dedicate our government resources to make sure that the citizens don't need to uh, pay for API usage fee by themselves. We should provide the underlying maps, underlying longitude, latitude, all the APIs, and and trust the citizens with these urban data. So not only do we publish the stock level of all the pharmacies, as you can see here, the green ones are ones that still with a lot of masks in stock. Um, we also have the real time, uh, uh, updated every 30 seconds at a time uh, for all adult and all the children's masks 
available in all the pharmacy, and it's all completely automated. And so, for even people who don't like viewing maps, maybe people with blindness, they can use voice assistants, they can use chatbots, and all of them get the same inclusive access. And because Taiwan has more than 99.99% of health coverage, people who show any symptom will then be able to take the medical mask from a nearby pharmacy, go to a local clinic, knowing surely that they will get treated fairly and without incurring any financial burden. It's a financial burden, but it doesn't stop there. Yeah. The CV technologist also made a lot of support. That lots of people see, people see that our supply, for example, when we started rationing like three masks per week, around this time, we increased to be nine masks per, per two weeks for adult and 10 for children. Uh, and these uh, are gets visibility from everybody because this is not a government website. This is just a civil society's contribution. And this also showed us where in Taiwan do we have an oversupply or undersupply. And we co-designed this experience with the pharmacy and we show this to our premier every week. So uh, we can see him smiling happily here because according to analysis, uh, the accessibility of mask uh, at that time peaked at 70%, meaning that there's like 20% or so of people who never collected masks. It turned out that they are in large municipality in the north. They work very long hours. They started working when the pharmacies have not opened. They stopped working when the pharmacy have closed. So we had to work with uh, convenience stores, which opens 24 hours a day, which can use the same national health insurance card to go there and collect your mask anytime. And at, at that time, then, uh, in, uh, we're, we're 23 million people, right? Uh, and now 20, 21 million people have used the mask service one or another, which which means that more than 90% of people not have access to medical mask and thereby ensuring the R0 value that is under one, that is controlled. So because of that, we ensure the fairness through the feedback from the social sector and also collaboration from the economic sector. So it's a sort of harnessing the collective intelligence to, to improve your, your response exactly. to the nation. Yes. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about quite a lot in the UK is around contact tracing, mm -hmm. um, and particularly well, whether that's sort of manual contact tracers and sort of doing things via interview and people sending their contacts uh, mm -hmm. to our National Health Service, or whether it's um, using an app. What's mm -hmm. your approach been to contact tracing in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Yes. In Taiwan, uh, we make sure that... Um, all the uh, information that we uh, collect, there is a civil society website called Taiwan Can Help That Us. Uh, that this is not a government website. Uh, all of it is crowdsourced and crowdfunded. That you can look at uh, our designs. Um, basically, we rely on data that's already collected. Uh, for example, the cell phone uh, strength uh, data to make sure that people who return uh, to Taiwan in an airport, they have the choice of going into a quarantine hotel, in which case they are physically barred from leaving that hotel for 14 days. Or if they don't live with vulnerable people, like very old people, they can also choose home quarantine, in, in which case their phone is um, basically put into the digital fence. And if their phone leaves the like 50 me uh, meter radius, uh, that is the triangulation uh, resolution solution uh, of the, the uh, perimeter, then uh, SMS is sent to the local household manager wardens or the local police station who will then check of what happens to you. So basically, we don't collect new data. We reuse existing data uh, and use it in a way that sends SMS automatically, uh, kind of like how uh, before an earthquake or uh, after a heavy rainfall, we send automatic warning uh, to a geofence. And this is called the digital fence that retains the data for 14 days. And after which, of course, there's no constitutional basis for us to run that data. But that data is already collected by all the telecoms anyway. So we see this as uh, proportional. It's ruled already as constitutional by the Constitutional Court after SARS. And this, of course, uh, be, uh, beats the 2003 response, which is to barricade the entire hospital unannounced and with no fixed termination date. And this is also important because we then never had to rely on application level tracing, which only makes sense if a majority of people start installing it. The cell phone tower triangulation and digital fence works regardless of which phone you're using. Uh, again, we've had a lot of discussion um, in the UK and elsewhere about the sort of ethics of keep and privacy debates about you know, people's data and how the mm -hmm. government's mm -hmm. using it. And um, mm -hmm. obviously some of that sort of digital fence technology 
you mentioned that it's deleted quite quickly, but it can be very intrusive. How have you been? How, how have you dealt with those sort of privacy debates with your? Well, if you office? don't like the digital fence and you prefer to stay in the quarantine hotel for fourteen days, that's your choice, and we even pay you a stipend either way uh, of ra- uh, of around I think a hundred euros uh, per day. Uh, and but if you break the quarantine, is uh, a thousand times that fine. But in any case, so so the point is that of course being put into a quarantine hotel is also an intrusion uh, on pretty much anything, right? On the freedom of movement and so on. And because the digital fence is not GPS location, right? It, it only knows uh, the kind of general perimeter of the phone. It doesn't know like which room in your home you are in. So the basic idea is that it should be proportional, uh, which is more or less like if you're staying in the hotel, the hotel, of course, makes sure that you cannot use the elevator to go down, right? So, so that's roughly the same thing. Um, and so, but we do understand that not everybody supports these measures. The CECC, the latest numbers, uh, 94% of people support these measures. Uh, previously, it was 91% uh, when the digital fence was being rolled out. So we thank the 6% or the 9% of the population which keep us honest and accountable because we have never declared a station, uh, situation of emergency. We're still operating entirely under constitutional law limit, which means that every administration t- uh, detection um, tactics we take, we need to be accountable to the MPs and to explain it to people. So if people understand how it works, the science behind it, that's how we get the 91% of support or 94 now, but we still thank the remaining 9% or 6% for keeping us honest. How has all the work that you've been doing over the, the last decade or so to engage the public, um, you know, opening things up to consultation, how much has that helped build that sort of trusted relationship? A lot, a lot. A lot of our communication strategy, for example, was developed way before the coronavirus. It was developed uh, as a way to counter disinformation uh, using a tactic that we call humor over rumor. And the idea is that because we, we, we cannot do takedowns, takedowns is against the principle uh, of Taiwan being the most open society in, in the whole of Asia. So we're forced to innovate to counter the narrative of conspiracy theories, of which there's a lot, especially during pandemic, but also leading up to an election without resorting to administrative takedowns and uh, encroaching the journalist freedom because we want to work with journalists, not against journalists. So what we have discovered is that um, the viral uh, messages that are toxic and polarizing is a little bit like a virus in itself, kind of a virus of the mind. And the reason why it has a high R value, uh, that is to say a person will look at it and just automatically share it to many people, um, is because that it provokes a sense of outrage. If you provoke a sense of outrage, people share it much more than if it provoked other kind of feelings. And so how do we vaccinate against outrage? become the main uh, question. And we discover that if we can respond within two hours, a fun message and that capitalizes on the same keywords, but makes people laugh, then it's mutually exclusive with the feeling of outrage. It's actually impossible to feel outrage about something that you've already laughed about. And so, for example, during the uh, pandemic, it's a stressful time. People feel anxious, lots of panic buying lots of conspiracy theories. And there was a panic buying of tissue papers. There was a rumor that said, well, Taiwan has been ramping up the mass production from 2 million a day to 20 million a day. It's a, quote, same material, unquote, as tissue papers. So people panic buy it. So the same premier who smiled happily here with the convenience stores uh, pushed this within two hours and now showing his bottom, wiggling it a little bit, and says a very large print that each of us only have one pair of Botox. Um, And so meaning that we don't need to panic buy. And a clear table that says, well, the facial masks are made out of domestic material, while tissue paper are imported using South American material. And this went absolutely viral because, you know, this whole meme, this design is literally a tissue paper box. And so (laughs) people, uh, and uh, they they are very uh, interested, curious even, because that's the first time that the premier made himself a, a butt of the joke, so to speak. Uh, and so because of that, uh, it, it has a much higher R value than the conspiracy theory. And people who have laughed about it will stop believing the conspiracy theory. So that rumor died down within a day or two. And finally, we found out the person who spread the rumor in the first place was the tissue paper reseller. 
and this is not just a single shot um, social media work. Every day, the CECC daily press conference gets translated by the spokes dog of the Ministry of Health and Welfare, or Zhong Chai, the Doga CEO, the, the Shiba CEO. And they translated, for example, this is physical distancing. Um, in, when you're outdoors, you need to keep two Doga away from one another. When you're indoor, you have to keep three Doga away, or hand sanitation rules. Uh, remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing, or um, uh, wearing a mask. Uh, it reminds you not to put your hand uh, to your mouth as the dog does here. So remember to pre-order your mask. And all of this uh, factual humor that have a scientific basis spreads faster than rumor. That is how we make sure Taiwanese people feel calm and collected even during the pandemic. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we touched a little bit on some of the work that you've sort of done before um, the pandemic around digital uh, government and public uh, engagement in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about your sort of general approach mm -hmm. to social sure. digital innovation as, as digital minister. Sure. So this is my office, uh, literally my office, the Social Innovation Lab. Uh, it is in the heart of Taipei, uh, just uh, near the uh, Da'an Central Park and the Jianguo Flower Market. And there's a, literally a park. Uh, we tore down all the walls so people can see very transparently as I work. Uh, and people can just knock the door every Wednesday and have 40 minutes of my time uh, and just chat about pretty much anything as long as they agree to publish the transcript or the video online. And because of this, uh, I'm very accessible. People can see that whenever people feel that there is kind of a tension uh, between, say, economic development on one side, environmental protection on the other, or scientific innovation on one side and social justice on the other, um, instead of uh, relying on uh, different siloed ministries, uh, each ministry that's participating in the social innovation uh, have a secondment uh, in my office. So my office is literally from like 12 different ministries, and each of them agreed to work out loud, meaning that all the new ideas that they develop get spread automatically to the people. So when people come up with a new innovation, a social innovation, for example, self-driving tricycles, they can work with nearby flower market to ensure that instead of a technologist dictating the social norm, it is the society working with those self-driving tricycles to say, hey, maybe in the flower market, this can be kind of self-driving shopping carts that follow people around, you buy some flowers, you put into it, and it follows you. And that is not the way that it was originally designed. But through the idea of open innovation, we can change a, a lot of that part and make a co-design, a collaborative design, so that it then responds to the social norms. This is called norm-first design, or in SDG terms, 1717, encouraging effective partnerships. And all the best ideas, we choose five ideas every year that receive a trophy from the president, and the trophy is a micro projector. There's a shape of Taiwan and a micro projector um, underneath it. And when you turn on the micro projector, it shows Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, handing the trophy to you, which is very meta, it's a self-describing trophy. Uh, and that symbolizes whatever you have built in the past three months in a data collaborative, we uh, do everything we can to make your idea into national policy within the next 12 months. So that ensured availability of cross-sectoral data and making sure that whether it's air quality, water quality, um, sustainable education for global citizenship, all of those great ideas are voted into existence using quadratic voting, which is again another social innovation. So basically it's a system to make sure that the best idea gets amplified automatically into the national scale. Um, I've got a quote from your president here actually, which is, do it bravely, dare to make mistakes. That's right. I think people often find governments can be quite risk averse because of the, the nature of the, the sort of world they operate in. How do you overcome that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually a, a UK idea that we learned. It's called a sandbox. Uh, whereas the, the UK initially applied this idea to fintech, we have applied it to pre pretty much everything. Um, and so it could be a, a platform economy sandbox. Uh, the Social Innovation Lab was a sandbox for self-driving vehicles. Now the self-driving buses are going to the street of Taipei City. Um, there's 5G sandboxes uh, for um, especially above 6 gigahertz uh, for a limited place to try that use of 5G. 
uh, there's actually uh, we did our sandbox regulations is phrase such that you can challenge each and every ministry's regulations, except for two things. That's money laundering and funding terrorism, because we know what happens. We don't have to experiment on these two things. But otherwise, everything is fair game. And so because of that, um, the government basically worked with the innovators. I tour around Taiwan to the places that are least connected. That is to say, to who are most difficult to travel to my uh, office at the Social Innovation Lab. And the local um, co-ops, the local social entrepreneurs, uh, the local um, elders uh, in both sense uh, from the indigenous nations and so on, uh, they just, uh, in a regular town hall, they just voice their concern. The difference is that because we have broadband as a human rights, no matter where I am, uh, for 16 euros per month, there's unlimited 4G bandwidth, at least 10 megabits per second, otherwise it's my fault, personally. Uh, and so through those cultural translators, uh, we connect to the people in the social innovation lab, as I mentioned, 12 ministries, each of them section chief or higher level, who listen to the local people of what they truly need. And this has two benefits. First, that it doesn't get lost in translation, right? They hear exactly what the local people want. And second, if the local people want to try something that's not uh, like a great area uh, by the current regulation, they can say, okay, let's try it out for a year. And if it doesn't work, well, we think the investors for paying the tuition, basically, everybody learns something where the investor lose the initial investment. It's like reverse lottery. Uh, but if uh, they works, then uh, they get a first mover advantage. And then uh, we have a new law or regulation that's co-created by PayPal. But of course, the obvious question is that then how do we know at the end of that year it's a good idea or not? How do we listen at scale and get the people's feedback? Well, we also use AI for that. There's an AI-powered conversation. Uh, by AI, I mean assistive intelligence called Polis, where it lets people see what other people feel about any particular issue. For example, during the Uber case uh, in 2015, we shared the data. We asked for three or four weeks of what people feel about it. And the best idea are the ones that take care of people's feelings. And finally, we turn it into a regulation. So at that time, no matter whether people is pro-Uber or against Uber, actually everybody agree that passenger liability insurance, their registration uh, and the taxation are the most important thing. And so we made that into our new regulation. So every time we run police, we see that while the social media and some institutional media may over-focus on the ideological divisions, we don't actually touch that. We acknowledge that. But we just work on the consensus statements, which are something that everybody agrees with their neighbors about. And we just regulate those into existence. Nowadays in Taiwan, police is regularly used. Um, every civil servant learns that they can just run a police conversation, wait for three weeks or four weeks. And voila, they have a set of rough consensus that they can base their regulation on. Um, this is actually one of the first questions that somebody's um, asked. And just to remind everybody, um, I will be putting questions to Audrey very shortly. Um, so if you'd like to ask any, you can use hashtag IFG Digital on Twitter. You can use the chat on this live stream broadcast, or you can go to bit.ly slash IFG Tongue. Um, so Nathan Young um, sort of said he read that you'd use the VTaiwan uh, platform, which uses Polis to mediate between taxi drivers and citizens, and um, that was a few years ago. So what new steps have you been taking on crowdsourcing policy since then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we've been since uh, combining the use of polis of face-to-face -face deliberations, much as uh, what I showed uh, in this teleconference um, room, uh, where we bring all the uh, five municipalities and many more cities into the same uh, large virtual room. Uh, we make sure that we host such an open collaboration session um, every once in a while, actually uh, two times per, per month. And just actually um, this morning, we're talking about uh, that yes, uh, last year, we used polis, five polis actually, to talk about how to open up the hiking, the mountaineering, um, the restrictions about hiking. And now we're talking about opening up the sea and how those sea sports and so on uh, need to be uh, opened up for more people to understand uh, the ocean uh, and preserving the sustainability of the ocean. The Taiwan has like 10% of the world's marine the biodiversity. And all these are, of course, all very open-ended questions of which polis is perfect uh, to, to do. And so we can combined polis with this national join platform. It's called join.gov.tw, which is a single um, 
platform, a single stop platform for e-petitions, for regulatory pre-announcements and consultation, like the opening up mountains and, and the ocean. And also, most importantly, it's also a participatory budget platform. So it's the same platform. And you can see how each and every uh, ministry is doing its budgets. You can see that long-term healthcare is at the moment the top um, thing that people are concerned about. You can see the KPIs, how much they are uh, working. And there's a um, comment board, of course. And then there's also quarterly responses that says that how we have changed our uh, ongoing policy. So this, while V Taiwan was mostly about like pre-legislation, we now have completely the full life cycle so that even during the 10-year project, that's the long-term healthcare project, we're on only the third year. You can, uh, between 2017 and 2026, uh, work in real time uh, with the public servants here, and they only uh, answer once publicly, and everybody can very easily discover like how this um, presidential promise, how this long-term project is doing. And so a single um, join.gov.tw is our main uh, change after the initial prototype in V Taiwan. Now pretty much all the regulations and most of the draft bills went through this public consultation process for almost always uh, 60 days. And so that's the norm. If they fast track it to 14 days, they have to write why. And so uh, the norm is to do a public consultation for each and everything. And so because of this join, that you with the TW has more than 10 million unique visitors out of the country of 23 million people. That's almost half of the people. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start taking questions from Slido now. Um, so, and um, people just to remind everybody watching that you can, as well as submitting questions on Slido, actually vote for your favourites. So I'm going to start with the, the top voted questions so far. Um, this is from Gavin Heyman uh, of the Open Contracting Partnership which is how did Taiwan handle emergency procurement and how do you keep it transparent if it involves sole sourcing um, and how do you make sure that you sort of get the resources through to the front line and make sure that they've made it through to the front line? That's an excellent question. Um, in particular, because we have not declared the emergency situation. And so all of the, the things that I show you was done using uh, regular procurement regulations. Uh, and in our regular procurement regulation, there's uh, something that says um, if the uh, minister uh, is willing to say that uh, this needs to go to a specific vendor, uh, they, they can actually do so uh, without consulting anybody, basically putting their name on it. Uh, but of course, there's a limit to it. Uh, I think this only applies to things that are around uh, or under 25,000 uh, British pounds. Uh, and so for each and every uh, prototypes like this, they have this kind of discretionary budget use that we use uh, often to explore the various different solutions. So that's one answer in that we can do an early design uh, procurement in emergency. If it works, then of course we do a larger one with the proper uh, process of multiple bids. And the other thing is that the, uh, the social sector actually contributes a lot of these things without any procurements needed. Basically, uh, for example, when we did this uh, mass map, out of nowhere, um, the HTC, which is a company that you know used to make pretty good phones, still makes pretty good phones, uh, but mo most of them get bought by Google, uh, HTC uh, makes a, a chatbot, a, a line chatbot, and that actually solves a major problem with maps, which is, um, is quite bandwidth intensive. So with a chatbot uh, formulation, people can just uh, go to the chatbot, ask, uh, I'm here, where are my nearby pharmacy, and it shows a few cards. And it doesn't need to zoom in or out or anything, it just takes you there. And they finish the development in like 24 hours without any procurement, because we publish the open data every 30 seconds. So for the chatbot developer, that's, that's golden, because then you can go to the nearby pharmacy, swipe your NHI card, procure, uh, sorry, purchase uh, nine masks. And after like a couple of minutes, the ch chatbot can actually tell you that this uh, stock, if you're a adult, then this become uh, like 49, right? So, so basically it's instant gratification, something line chatbots really like. Uh, and also people are basically participating in a, a ledger this way. This is a distributed ledger. If you go to the pharmacy, purchase, and after a couple of minutes, this rather goes up into like 60, 
then you will call 1922 and something bad happened because the, the ledger isn't working. So instead of the traditional Freedom of Information Act, which uh, usually publishes like every week uh, or at most every day, this is not open data anymore. This is open API because it's almost always real time. And once it's real time, there's a lot in those uh, service providers, the chatbot developers' uh, interest to provide this as a value-added service at pretty much no development cost to their uh, customers. And because of that, people just develop it voluntarily. They don't really need procurement money because this also adds to their bottom line. Excellent, thanks. Um, we've got a question now from Kate Lachlan. Uh, she asks, isn't there a problem with the geofence that you were talking about earlier, that people could leave their homes without taking their phones with them? Yeah, which is why, of course, the chatbot uh, checks on you uh, a little bit, um, like in random intervals, and ask, how are you feeling? What's your temperature? Would you like to take a picture with your thermometer? Uh, and things like that. There's, of course, that part of that. And if your phone runs out of battery, then, of course, um, after a few minutes, a police will come and visit you. Uh, and so, but people are addicted to their phone anyway. So in practice, we don't, we don't see a lot of that problem. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to roll a couple of questions uh, which are related together. So Nathan Yang asks, um, what do you think is the best way to reduce the siloing of information within different parts of government? And that matches quite nicely with this question from Joe Mitchell, which is, have you had any trouble convincing your fellow ministers of the importance of transparency, trusting the citizens and so on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Taiwan, uh, we reduce the siloing of information by making sure that when we procure, um, we can make sure that the vendor can deliver a machine-readable version, that's to say the open API specification or OS3. Uh, I think the GDS in UK eventually recommended OS3, uh, but that's, I think, um, two years and a half after we did. <laughs> we, we, we recommended that uh, even before OS became the official standard. And I think that was in late 2016. And we basically said that during procurement, um, we treat open ABI as a sort of accessibility because there's a section in our procurement uh, template that says if the uh, vendor charges extra to make it so that people with blindness can uh, see the information, then that vendor is not professional and could actually be disqualified for charging extra to make uh, their websites accessible. Accessibility should be universal, it should be the default. And we kind of changed the template to say that machine to machine uh, API is a kind of people with blindness. And if you discriminate against bots, well, we didn't quite say that, but if you say that you need to charge a lot more uh, for providing open API for uh, this human visible and human input places, then you could also get disqualified just by doing that. And so that kind of forced all our vendors to speak open API by default. And once you speak open API by default, of course you would design your front end in a decoupled way that basically works across all the different uh, like maps, apps, chatbots, and voice assistant, because then they all will talk to the same API. And once the procurement uh, system integrator gets into the habit of API-first design, then the siloing of information is automatically solved, because your front end, your back end, is then uh, thoroughly decoupled. And everybody who wants to use the same back end data for a different front end application, just like the HTC DeepQ team, they do not need to ask anything about the other front end, like map developers, because they would just look it up on the open data portal and then see where the open API is. So our open data portal, if you refresh quickly enough, then you just tick the API box and that ensure that your procurement goes successfully. Excellent. And um, how have you sort of approached uh, bringing other ministers and other parts of government with you in this sort of mm -hmm. journey yeah. towards more transparency? Sure. sure. So, so my theory of change is very simple, right? Um, it's three axes. It first is saves uh, people time, re reduce the, the chores. It reduces political risk because when it's the people's idea and we just support people's idea, there's no re political risk whatsoever. Uh, and finally, th there's due credit for all the public servants involved. Because back in the day, before that we had this open collaboration meetings, for these people that you see here, the section chiefs, career public service, if things go wrong, it's their fault. But if things go right, well, it's the minister's credit. It would be my credit, right? But now, because people see them eye to eye, 
and we keep a transparent record of each and every decision made. It's their credit when th things go right. And uh, it's my, my fault if things go wrong, because I'm the one who came up with this crazy idea of radical transparency. And so this flips the, the, the ideas around, uh, around uh, credit sharing. And so uh, it's like three dimensions. So as I said, less work, less risk, more credit. And we only make Pareto improvement, meaning that we never trade one for the other two. We only make piecemeal improvement on one without sacrificing the other two. And so from the other minister's viewpoint, this is essentially a, a, a no-brain deal because who wouldn't want, you know, less work, uh, less risk and more credit and more trust? Thank you. Um, we've got a question now from Julian McRae, the director of Engage Britain. What's been most effective in getting civil servants to trust and actually seek out the input of citizens into developing policy? The most effective way, as I have found out, um, is that uh, when we have no idea. If you have some idea, then people are either for that idea or against the idea. But if you get into the habit of saying, well, I have no idea, please come up with some idea, and then, then that always works. And so the citizens uh, really like the uh, agenda setting phase of policy development because that's where their experience truly counts. When you move forward into, in design thinking terms, into develop and delivery, that actually requires a lot of professional expertise. But when you're in the first diamond, that is to say, if you're just discovering and defining, then people are very happily contributing their ideas. And uh, we um, basically have a uh, called PO.P.T.W. PO is for Participation Officer, uh, that outlines um, what is participation officer, the directions, how do you choose collaboration topics, and the principle for how to interview people, the process, the toolkit, and things like that. There's this whole um, regulations, if you want to copy it in your uh, jurisdiction, please feel free to do so. Uh, and we make sure that people learn about how to choose the proper ideas, the proper uh, processes uh, to, to make that happen. And so, as I said, if you start with agenda setting, then people can very easily see that they are themselves setting the agenda. So most of our collaboration meetings, why it's so important to have open uh, registration of presidential hackathon, like more than 200 teams this year, or sandbox applications, or the joint platform with e-petitions and so on, that's because when people mobilize to give us those ideas, there's already some stakeholders there. And so for the civil service, uh, this is guaranteed to be more signal than noise. Um, and when you're in that stage, if you take away the reply button, as we did during Polis, and also actually Slido too, there's no uh, reply button on Slido either. If you don't have the reply button, then people can only add to each other's ideas. They can never um, attack each other. They can never subtract from each other's idea. If you don't agree with me, you probably have to propose something that p other people agree with. If you don't think a slight of question is worth asking, it doesn't uh, pay to attack that person. Uh, you have to propose something more interesting for other people to upvote. So also design your interaction platform so that for civil servants, you always get more signal than noise. And because of that, then the civil servants will trust the system more if it's early enough in the agenda setting stage. Uh, just a reminder to everybody watching, if you'd like to put a question uh, to Audrey, you can use hashtag IFG Digital on Twitter. You can use the live stream chat on this broadcast or you can use our Slido, uh, which is bit.ly slash IFG Tongue. Um, I'm going to take another question from Slido now, uh, which is actually about one of the processes that you mentioned earlier. Um, could you explain how quadratic voting works? Okay, certainly. So in quadratic voting, everybody, the 10 million visitors um, <clears throat> of join.gov.tw looks at the 200 or so uh, proposals uh, on that platform. Uh, and then everybody gets 99 points. Now, every single um, project need to be already SDG indexed, meaning that it need to respond to one or more of the sustainable development goals. So they are all problems worth solving. The main thing to ask people is what are the best ideas that's worth coaching, right? So people, of course, there's no one who uh, understand all the uh, details of all the 169 sustainable development goal targets. So people naturally will mobilize and vote for the one that they feel the most um, interested in. However, if you give people 99 points, chances are if you uh, like dot voting, people will just vote 99 points. 
to the first thing that they think is good, or their, their friends and family call them to vote. Quadratic voting says that you can't do that. If you vote for one vote, that's going to cost you one point. But if you're going to vote two votes, that's going to cost you four points. And three votes is going to cost you nine. And so with 99 points, all you can do is vote nine votes. Um, this particular one, which is SDG 6.5, which is about using a IoT device on the waterways to automatically detect the pollutions to the aggregate lines uh, by the uh, industrial plants nearby. And for the low abiding industrial plants, also buy those water boxes to prove that the pollution came from upstream. It's a pretty good idea. And so, uh, and power by distributed ledger. And so if you really like the idea, you can vote nine, but then you still have 18 points left out of your 99. So you don't want to squander those points. So we'll probably look into other ideas, for example, using com computer vision to reduce marine pollutions by stopping those marine debris before they hit the, the shores. And that's a pretty good idea. And you still have, what, 18. So you will vote four, which costs you 16. And then you have two more. So maybe you look into two other points. At some point, you will discover that some and something have synergy with something else. So maybe you take some of these back and do the seven and seven. And so in mechanism term, in design terms, in mechanism design terms, the marginal cost and the marginal return is equivalent in the quadratic voting, which means that the most strategic voting method is to reveal your true social preference, which contributes more to the com complete picture of the sustainable goals. And people are motivated to learn about four or five of the sustainable goals. So unlike traditional one person, one vote or one person dot voting, most people feel they have won when we announced the top 24 this year, because other than uh, the people who have never voted, uh, everybody who have voted, they on average vote for maybe five or six teams. And one of them is bound to be part of the top 24. So everybody feel they have won, unlike the traditional kind of binary voting where half of people will feel they have lost or everybody in, in some other cases. Yeah. Uh, next, we have a question from John M, uh, which is, how have you addressed access to hardware issues for people with lower incomes, where the cost could potentially bar their access to some of these systems? That's called public libraries and also uh, digital opportunity centers. As I mentioned, broadband is a human right, but also they can go to their local digital opportunity center uh, or public library uh, and just um, rent. Um, for, for Novi, actually, uh, a device that's guaranteed to be made in the last three years. Great. Um, we next have a question from uh, UK Open Data Expert, Peter Wells. Morning, Peter. Um, why do you think the UK and indeed other European Union countries have focused on app-based contact tracing rather than using existing data? And do you think anything might change that, perhaps looking, looking to the Taiwanese example? Well, the thing is that the digital fence worked the way it is using very coarse grained, uh, like 50 meter, precisely because uh, we do border control. So we do very strict enforcement. And during those 14 days of quarantine, a lot of human rights, not just privacy, but right of movement uh, is, you know, encroached. But then it applies fairly to everybody. So it also doesn't have a labeling effect. However, if you don't do defense at your uh, ports, then you have to do defense in the community. And once it's in the community, um, 50 meters is too coarse grained. And that's why people start getting the idea of oh, we should use Bluetooth or even worse, we should use GPS data if it's stored in uh, centralized databases. Um, so I think it's a conscious choice uh, by Taiwan to do most of our protection, uh, the strict uh, measures at the borders so that we can live uh, in a much more relaxed fashion uh, in communities so that we ensure that hand sanitation, mask use, physical distancing, these three measures together is enough to put our value of being under one. So that's a conscious choice, but you probably cannot do that unless you have near universal mask wearing, uh, which of course um, is a culture thing. But in Taiwan, as I mentioned uh, in the Doga CEO picture, we, we put these pictures together because we say that masks are something that reminds you not to touch your face and wash your hands properly. So mask is a social signal. It's mostly a psychological tool. And, and for this, everybody agrees with that, right? The scientific evidence and so on about masks uh, like uh, blocking uh, filtration or whatever capability, that's up to the debate and up to the fabric of the mask. 
But wearing even a mask made out of a T-shirt um, reminds you not to touch your face and reminds you to wash your hands properly. Probably everybody can accept that. And by a few people, even just a few people in a large crowd, sending the social signal, it enables people to take care of each other saying, hey, why are you not protecting yourself from your own hands? You should probably also wear a mask. And that enabled this idea of wearing mask to have a high R value uh, in the idea, idea uh, meme space. Uh, and because of that, everybody started wearing mask. Excellent. I think you've answered a question that Judith Richards had put on Slido, actually, which was, uh, do you think masks are key, especially in places where we cannot social distance? It sounds like your, your answer to that would very much be, be yes, as it sort of um, helps Definitely. shape the rest of the strategy. Um, just to remind everybody, we've got about 10 minutes left. If you've got any final questions for Audrey, please do put them on Slido. Now that's bit.ly slash IFG tongue. Um, so we have a question from Steve Lloyd. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in, in the UK recently about local lockdown measures. So perhaps not the entire country um, is abiding by the same rules and it's able to adjust according to, to the level of outbreak. Um, so he's asking, do you have any advice regarding the moving out of lockdown measures on a local level? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we, we have um, simulated, um, like, if there is a limited local community transmission, uh, there may be uh, places where we will just have a certain area that is self-sustaining, meaning that it has most of the kind of groceries and things like that, so that we can do a very contained local lockdown while the rest of Taiwan still free of lockdowns. So that we have simulated. But what uh, Steve Lloyd is asking is essentially the other way around. That is to say the rest of the, the country in lockdown, but only one part uh, out of lockdown. Um, if it's an island, then of course, go for it. <laughs> but otherwise, I think you need to carefully plan, as we did on the border control, uh, how, how to um, screen the people and how to make sure that people who tra transfer between those different uh, municipalities uh, carry uh, a, the same quarantine obligation, essentially, uh, as we did for our returning citizens. If you can do the quarantine and contact tracing, using regular interviews and so on, well, then there's no reason why you could not do that because that's essentially what Taiwan did uh, because we're a set of islands. But if you cannot uh, do that uh, with efficiency, if your contact tracer's um, uh, capa capacity is not there, then of course there's an inherent risk uh, in doing that. And that actually is one of the points that, that we made in Taiwan Can Help That Us, which is this, uh, as I mentioned, crowdsourced um, website of the Taiwan model uh, is that we make sure that people who um, eventually see those measures such as the lockdowns and now the partial relaxation and, and so on understand the scientific reason why. So this person is Chen Qianren, uh, vice president of Taiwan at the time, trained in John Hopkins, uh, our top epi epidemiologist, actually wrote a textbook on epidemiology. Uh, and so our top scientist doesn't have to convince our top official because he was the top official. Uh, and in, in this case, um, he recorded this crash course on the popular MOOC uh, data, database, the HaHao, uh, where a lot of people enroll in online learning. So I think more than 20,000 people uh, enrolled in the first uh, few days, uh, me included, so that he explained all the different models uh, and the different simulations. And if you're interested, you can also, um, there's a interactive version of that at, um, I think, Nikki Case, nkase.me slash COVID-19, uh, that uh, says what happens next, uh, which you can take Dr. Chen Jianlin's courses, but then verify his numbers by simulating all the various lockdown scenarios and things like that. So my, my main point is that um, if everybody become kind of an amateur epidemiologist, then this kind of localized measures will work because everybody who travel there and travel out of it will understand why are those measures in place and what effect is it having on the population. But if people don't understand the underlying science, um, then of course there will be people who do not um, um, innovate uh, to in advance for those goals, but rather innovate um, in the opposition of those goals. Uh, I think that's the, the most mild way that I can put this. Excellent. I have a feeling we'll have quite a few people enrolling on that course after this event has finished today. Um, we've got a question now from Terence Eden, um, who works on Open Standards at NHSX and did a fantastic talk on why making things open makes things better as part of our Data Byte series of events last month. Um, he asks, 
we see lots of open source code from Taiwan and indeed from other countries. Um, but most countries are still trying to roll out their own coronavirus related services. What's stopping the reuse of your code? Well, nothing is stopping reuse of our code. I think this is mostly culture. Uh, if we put our code up uh, out there, as we did in the coronavirus hackathon, uh, cohack.tw. Um, as you can see, uh, everybody who participated see very clearly uh, that uh, from various different countries, including the UK, um, people design those privacy enhancing technologies that enable, for example, working with contact tracers, but uh, all the data is kept in your own phone and only sends a one-time link to the contact tracer for the information they need without divulging any privacy of anybody else you have uh, encountered. And autonomy does that on a um, community level. Gemini does the storytelling, part visualization of that and so on. And each and every one of them uh, agree to abide by the spirit of the open source and agree to use the MIT license, which is one of the most permissive licenses uh, for their work. And so as more countries participate in this sort of open innovation, people will get more into the culture of just learning from one another. But if you start with a uh, procurement strategy that doesn't include open source and open API in even template language, as Taiwan did, then of course it works very counterintuitively because after all, you did not pay Taiwan, and why would you then use Taiwan's code? So there's a lot to do to change the culture around procurement to basically uh, avoid the not invented here um, culture. I think this is a culture thing and not, not at all a license thing. The license thing is just the underpinning. The culture is what needs change around procurement. And, and how, how do you change that, do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, two things, right? First, write it into the template language so that open is by default. And if you don't uh, do open, you have to write a reason why. This is like the regulation that needs to be open for open consultation for 60 days. There are still ways to kind of work around that, but you have to say exactly why. And that why is also kind of accountable to the entire population. So when there was a draft bill uh, where people said, uh, where the ministry said, oh, we need to fast track this to seven days because otherwise we will not meet the parliamentary schedule, they drew a lot of flack from the journalist who say you could have published a draft like a couple of weeks earlier, <laughs> then you will meet a parliamentary schedule and then you will still have at least 30 days of public deliberation. So making the default smart, that is my first uh, suggestion. The second thing is that the, the civil service uh, are also citizens. So many of them are also many, very much willing to use open data from other nearby um, siloed um, departments. And you need to encourage that this internal innovation or so-called intrapreneurship, right? So when the HTC, which is a contractor of the Center for Disease Control, uses the National Health Insurance Agency's uh, mask data, it, I made sure to publicly um, just give them a lot of credit to make sure that I share a lot of their stories in my talks to their ministers and so on. Because when the uh, the minister level encourage this kind of internal entrepreneurship and even participate like I did, like as a programmer, I just help fixing their code, uh, then people will get very encouraged to use data across silos, not personal data, open data across silos. But if the minister level doesn't give uh, it a thumbs up, then uh, they would end up absorbing the risk while getting no credit. And in, in which case there is no um, uh, culture possible for the open within the uh, public Public service. So for public citizens uh, to make sure that their social innovation get amplified, for the civil servants make sure that their ministers are uh, show an active interest uh, in building an open culture, and then you will have the culture of uh, avoiding the knee syndrome, the not invented here syndrome. So I'm going to squeeze in one final question, and it's actually a perfect final question from Joachim von Hallas on Slido. What are your ideas and developments for the future? What are you working on next? Okay, so um, as with uh, um, every other questions like this, this is time for me to read my job description. So <laughs> I mentioned about the sustainable goals and how my work is in the 17s, which is building effective partnership. Of course, that is my main uh, goal. Um, and our president promises in her second term, which begins um, just, just a month ago, uh, not even a month ago, that we will now have a dedicated uh, cabinet level um, digital council or ministry uh, 
uh, that takes care of this um, cross silo uh, policy making that enhances even more of reliable data and also do open innovation, making sure that open innovation is a dedicated council or ministry in Taiwan. Now, people ask a lot, why call it digital? Why not call it information and communication technology uh, or ICT? Because that's the more um, usual term as used in Taiwan, because Taiwan is, you know, Taiwan Semiconductor and so on, very good on ICT. Uh, but we insist on calling it digital. So I wrote a poem, a prayer that explains the difference between ICT and the digital. And that's my job description, which I'll read to you now. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. And that's digital. Thank you so much. What a perfect note to end on and what a great way to start the week. Um, thank you, everyone who's uh, tuned in. Thank you for some brilliant questions uh, that we've received from everybody. And please, everyone, thank me. Um, join me in a virtual round of applause for the fantastic Audrey Tang. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you.